Bonsoir, Jarin. Ah, hi. Hello, guys. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, gentlemen. What a pleasure to be on your live channel. Well, well the pleasure is ours. Ready, ready. Uh, uh, Can you can you see and hear us okay? We can see you yeah. a bit your background a bit far but we can see you fine and I can hear you well. We are, we are maybe we can bring it a bit closer. Can we bring it? Yes. yes. Let me try. Let's see if we will fit into the screen. Eli, don't forget to, uh, to to turn off the comments. Yes, turn off commenting. Let me apologize from our audience. We're going to kick off with Mr. Sahakian, both, Edward and Eddie. And once uh, we finish our uh, questions, we're going to open the comments and take your questions, audience. Eddie or Mr. Sahakian, Edward. Please call me Edward. And please, Eddie. <laughs> okay. At least once, Mr. Sahakian, and then we go Edward and Daddy. That's fine. That's fine. Edward, uh, Eddie, don't feel offended. I know you won't feel Please. offended, but Edward, we love you. Uh, <laughs> you're very kind. <laughs> and I love you all as well. <laughs> Thank you. We want you. We want you to live 150 years. Longer than the Queen. <laughs> inshallah, inshallah. But that's up to Allah, not up to yes. me. <laughs> sure. Of course. Believe it to God, of course. Just joking about it. If you allow me, uh, Edward and Daddy, <clears throat> uh, I will welcome you, but I have, like what I do usually, I have uh, a written notice, a written introduction, or a written welcome note. Let me read it, if you allow me, please. It will take only a few minutes. Please, 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 by all means. Okay. Do you hear me well, uh, both? Wonderful. Very well. Excellent. Uh, first, welcome on board. You don't know how much we love you um, from this part of the world. We do really love you, both of you. Edward, of course, you come first. Eddie, one day you will be also loved as much. Don't worry. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I, my written note goes like that. It is said that a great man turned tripping and falling to leaps, bounds, and achievements. Edward Sahakian an Iranian golden boy with Armenian roots, a protege and the successor to a wealthy family, roaming the European capitals with first-class airline tickets and crossing borders with Russia, warming up to expand his father's industrial empire. In 1978, Edward got caught in transition between Tehran and London. He couldn't go back home and watched his ancestors' heritage tumbling and lost in the revolution. He posed, but Edward didn't hesitate. He chose cigars to kick off a career and turn his passion to brick and mortar. This is how David of London has been incepted on the 29th, May 1980. A series of 41 years of odysseys where Greek gods intervened to crown Edward, the inheritor of the king of cigars, Zeno Davidoff. Eddie, don't feel offended, Eddie, once a nonchalant student in the U.S., and the Londoner banker took the U-turn back to where destiny had him placed in the first place, David of London, the battleship of Edward, to command and sail to new harbors and 
shorelines to counter. Would he succeed and elevate the business to new levels? We are tonight here to welcome two un-English gentlemen, yet very refined, very sophisticated, utterly polished, and supremely knowledgeable. Gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, I present you Edward and Eddie Sahakian. Usually people cannot express their gratitude when hosting the distinguished guests. I can. We lost also are very appreciative of this occasion. We are honored and happy and thrilled to host a father who has shaped the cigar business with his robust character and the son who has been given only a needle to craft a mountain, referring to Edward Legacy, the mountain. Before we start, I have a request. I, I, really, I really wish, Edward and Betty, that you accept our request. Cigar celebrities, when interviewed, has tendency to be abstract, diplomatic, intangible, romantic, very vague. Today, I plead to you to break the stereotype and without taking off the neck ties nor the cuffling, please loosen up, stretch, relax, chill, and be okay to commit few goofs. You don't. You gentlemen, both of you, don't do any goofs. But it's okay today if you do some, few. <laughs> On the other side, we would love to come to know more about this father-son affiliation, the stress, the anxiety, the dissatisfaction, the strains, as well as love, respect, happiness, and triumph. We have all, and allow me here to compliment Los Osos audience, the people that join us today, and despite we are few, but uh, proudly we are la creme de la creme in this part of the world as far as cigars and smoking the leaf is concerned. As I was saying, we have all watched all your videos and interviews, and we are all very thirsty to know the unknown things, to unleash the Pandora box and hear matters for the first time, if you allow us. Just let me, just let me add one thing, gentlemen. Good Go evening ahead, and good evening and Khosh <laughs> Amadid. <laughs> Dear Ali Adri Kassam, first of all, thank you so much for your most lovely description. Uh, perhaps in many cases exaggerated, but they are beautiful. I really enjoyed listening to what you were reading. And at the end, I will please, 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 please request you to send me a copy of that. It I is shall. So and it is so lovely. It's an honor. You said uh, a pleasure and honor. The pleasure, the honor, and the privilege is for me and Eddie to be here seeing each other. We can't touch each other, but we could see each other. We could hear each other. and uh, Hopefully one day. As we say, what comes out of the heart will sit on the heart. And it's the same uh, with us. Uh, I feel that we've known each other all our lives, and this is what uh, the magic of cigar is. Cigar brings all the nice people together, and here we are. Well said. Sitting well together. said. I have one question before I answer any questions that you may ask. Uh, are we allowed to smoke whilst we're talking to you, or is it a non-smoking <laughs> session? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we are ready. We are ready and prepared. Oh, this uh, one looks like look, it's the London. And for, and for oh tonight, we are smoking the 40th anniversary of London Davido. Oh, that is fantastic. You know what? I should smoke the same as well then. Let me get it for you then. It's right here. I was going to smoke something a bit older, but I will be smoking the same, my dear friend. Thank you. So we can all share an ashtray together, putting the same ashes there. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully one day. Sure. No, it's a, such a pleasure. And thank you so much. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, sometimes. Yeah, may, I, may I cut it for you? You can. Why not? Yeah. What is the son for if he doesn't cut the cigar for his father? <laughs> exactly. And if he exactly. Edward, please do pamper him. Otherwise, <laughs> I'll take the airplane and come to London to do that. Oh, he, uh, I wish, I wish you could do that. I wish we could do that. You know, we nearly came to Lebanon uh, last year for the uh, Phoenicia 40th anniversary. And oh, we had yeah, done yeah. all the bookings. We had been that was November. Them. November 19, we almost yes, came. Really, over, almost yes, three. Uh, November and we had exactly. booked our flights, we had booked the hotel, we had booked everything. And then, of course, at the last minute, unfortunately, it had to be, well, postponed or cancelled or both. Yeah. But, uh, postponed. But postponed. God willing, we will be able to welcome you here in London sometime in sure. the near future. Sure. If you can. We'll, we'll, be, we'll, be, we'll uh, be glad to visit you. Let me say this, uh, Kasem. If they came on 2018, you, you would have been uh, uh, seen as crowned as the champion of the Havana World Challenge, Qasim and myself. In Lebanon. Oh, that now I remember. Oh. Yeah, yes. We were crowned that same year, 2018. Congrats. When I, gentlemen, my questions are a bit out of the box. If any of my question offends any of you, you may stop me and we skip. <laughs> it, it'll be impossible to offend us. <laughs> Amongst friends, any question is a good question. <laughs> yeah, it is. Thank you very much. You will tell me what you think about our question at the end. Let me first... Uh, also, you recognize the Caesars, I'm sure. Absolutely. Ah. I'm taking. And we take have the matching one over here. <laughs> yeah. I have to say, this Caesar is very special to me. I mean, every Caesar is very special from Davidoff, but this one was given to me by Dr. Schneider, who was the chairman of the Ottinger Group uh, when uh, I started negotiating with them, and yeah. he presented this Caesars which was placed in a beautiful humidor, which is sitting there in my library, filled with some lovely Davidoff cigars on the occasion of the 25th anniversary of the show. Yeah. And, and now, of course, it's, it's, it's every time I use it, and I don't use it very often, I admit, mm -hmm. only on very special occasions when I'm sharing a cigar with friends. <laughs> hey. uh, I Thank it. you. <laughs> uh, so, so Please. let's when start with the question. Kick off with a couple of questions. Kasim will take it after me, and then we keep asking you questions until you say enough is enough. The, the, the night is young here. Well, absolutely. Here it's even younger in London. We're about, yeah. <laughs> about, about two hours, two and a half hours younger. Yeah, <laughs> two hours. Two hours, yeah. I'm not allowing myself to have a small drink. If you would love, would like to, that is that okay according to us? Absolutely. Course? Yeah. Look, if we're drinking, then what are you drinking, my dear friend? Uh, it's a Glenfiddich. It's a single malt. It's a simple 12 years old. Mm, lovely. It's beautiful. Well, as it's no secret, I like, uh, when I'm smoking a cigar, I like a drink which is slightly sweeter. And, oh, thank you, Eddie. So I'm going to join in, but with a nice rum. Rum. Very it's, good. It's got, it's the, the rum has that little bit of the sweetness, which makes it even more delicious. Glenfiddich is not a harsh whiskey, anyway. Glenfiddich. Next time we will drink the Davidoff whiskey together, the 40-year-old uh, anniversary whiskey. But in the meantime, to your good health. To you. Eli and Kassam, to your good health and to all our watchers and listeners. Cheers. Everybody's cheers, guys. good health. Cheers, gentlemen. Wishing cheers. you all I'm, health. I'm sharing with you only water, but cheers. Oh. Well, is, 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 do we say Sartain? Sartain. Exactly. Or we can say Salomati. 
Salam, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Salam. <laughs> yeah. I will start my question, Edward, to you. Uh, it's a live question. Usually I bluff my uh, guests. <laughs> <over>. <laughs> Then we move to a bit like uh, more serious heavy metal things. Edward, standing where you are today, looking back to your heritage and legacy, and if history has a rewind buzz that can take you back to Tehran, bring back all your lost properties and wealth, and redeem your sovereignty over your Andalusian industrial dynasty, would you press the buzz? Would you let go David of London as if it never happened? Your breweries, estates, wealth, political power versus David of London. Please take a moment and tell us your choice. And this, is, and this one is life question. Well, <laughs> let me put it this way, because I, I, I've been asked similar questions, perhaps not to this extent. Uh, it's true that I lost many, many things at the beginning of my life, active life. Came over a total stranger, hardly knew anybody in the streets. I used to walk up and down the streets of London, and I was surprised that so many people passing and I don't know one familiar face and nobody will know what that means until they go through it. I'm sure when you step out of your house in the morning, by the time you get to your office or whatever, you say at least Salam Alaikum to 10 people, if not more. That did not happen. So I was a total absolute stranger. And it took me a while to settle in. But it didn't take all that long. And at the end, now standing here and looking back, uh, I have to say, I lost a lot of things. But in return, I've gained so many more important things. I've, I've gained so many friendships that I would have not ever had. I've gained such pleasurable moments in life that it would have never happened. I'll tell you why I opened the shop. Now that you asked it, would I press the button and go back? No, I wouldn't. And I'll tell you exactly why. When I was opening the shop, and for all different reasons, it all happened by, it was a series of accidents and coincidences that dropped me into it. Next thing I know, I'm talking to the, uh, chairman of the Ottinger company, Dr. Schneider, who was passing by and had agreed to meet me and my uh, solicitor on the insistence of my solicitor. I mean, a total stranger coming to London. Who am I to come and open a shop, start a company? I, it's, if it's not impossible, it's very difficult. It would have never occurred to me. And of course, in the back of my mind is that, yes, I will be going back. Three months, six months, one year, I don't know, maybe two years. Uh, but uh, it was a series of coincidences that dropped me into this. In my previous life, I used to wake up in the morning and you faced all sorts of problems. The joy and the pleasure was little. The problems were immense. The more employees you have, the more headaches you have. We had in total uh, in the region of 12,000 employees. We had 12 factories. We had uh, our bottling lines. We had the breweries. It, it, it was a very large group. It wasn't only me, of course. It was my father had started it with his two brothers. So there were three brothers who had started that. And uh, each brother had... Uh, Three children. Well, one of them, one of my uncles had three sons. My father had two sons, myself and my brother, and my other uncle had two sons. So there were seven of us, and all hand in hand, 
everybody was involved in one part of the business and at the end all together at the whole business and slowly progressed. But the problems every day, the larger the business became, the more successful it became, the more difficult it became. Uh, you had to deal with, from the morning you started with the Ministry of the Health and then the Ministry of the Finance and then the Ministry of the Labor and then the Ministry of this and then the Ministry of that and then it was the Police Department and then the, head of the Traffic Department and that. It, it just never ever stopped. And once you, if you managed, if you managed to iron out all those problems, then it, it was, you had to talk to the representatives of the employees because they want to raise, they want to more salary, they wanted more benefits. It, it, there was always a problem to solve. And by the time you've solved one problem, there was another two waiting for you to get into it. So when I was talking here to my solicitor and he said, what would you do? What would you like to do? I said, well, I'm not going to do anything. I'm going back to Iran, of course. He said, well, let's say for whatever reason, you're unable to go. Is there anything you like to do? Is there any hobbies do you have? What's your interest in life? And this is after we had a lovely lunch. Uh, you know, we sat down and, okay, I have to go back one, uh, one page back. <laughs> Met this lawyer. I went to a lawyer because I realized I'll be stuck here for a while. How long, I wasn't sure. And, I got an appointment, went and met them. A young gentleman, 24 years old, just graduated from Cambridge. He was working for a very prominent firm and I was recommended to go to that firm. And it was my, my lucky day to meet this gentleman. His name was William, William Hurt. And uh, walked into his office. He said, oh, Mr. Sahakia, nice to meet you. What is your problem? So, said, well, I don't really have a problem as such, but that's the reason uh, I'm here is because I might not be able to go back for a while. I need to extend my visa, tourist visa. I have to uh, make sure I don't do anything wrong. The time I came to this country, don't forget we had the labor government here. We had yeah. then strikes in the streets. We had uh, uh, currency control. I mean, if you were coming to England and you had more than 25 pounds in your pocket, you had to declare it. You had to write it down on wow. a form exactly how much you had. Because on the way out, if you had one pound more than 25 pounds, you, they would either confiscate it or you had to declare it and you had to tell them how come you have that much more. Yeah. So I, I didn't want to do anything wrong. I, said, you know, I like to make sure uh, everything that is done, I do it in the correct way. I'm a guest in this country and I want to behave like a good guest. And we had a nice long chat. And as he was giving me his instructions what to do and what not to do, I took my pen and started making notes. Then said, don't make any notes, Mr. Sahakin. I've got everything printed on these three pages of paper. Here you are, follow these instructions. Anytime you need anything, call me, I will take it off from there. I said, well, thank you very much, thank you very much. And as it is a habit in, in our part of the world, you will understand what I'm saying. You don't leave the office of a lawyer, you don't leave the office of a doctor, you don't leave the office any I office. Without paying, of course. None yeah. of this, I will invoice you, you will invoice me. No, you, you, there and then, how much do I owe you? Here you are, thank you very much and goodbye. So I said, to, I'm sorry, sir, shall I settle my account with you, with your secretary downstairs to the doorman? I don't know, what is the, uh, the usual procedure here? And he said, well, um, actually, you know, I haven't done anything. It was a pleasure talking to you. Uh, there's no charge. Thank you very much. Oh, God, I felt so embarrassed. You know, I didn't expect that at all. I did not expect that to happen to me in London. In our part of the world, it could, but not here. <laughs> and I, 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 I turned around and I said, well, at least allow me to invite you for a spot of lunch in return. So that would be very nice. So a week later, we were sitting having lunch. As we sat down to have our lunch, it was Mr. Sahakian and Mr. Hurd. A bottle of wine later, we reached the dessert and the coffee, and the cognac is being poured in our glasses. And I've got my box of cigars, David of number two, pack of five, I still remember it. I'm playing with it, preparing it, so I was going to light up one, because in the, were the golden days of cigar smokers, you could not only smoke in the restaurants, they would come with a trolley, 
with the brandies and the whiskies and the cigars all there. He would open the humidor. What, which one would you like to smoke, sir? So I, prepared, I was preparing my cigars and he turned around. He said for the first time in our relationship that day, he said, oh, Edward, can I ask you a question? And taken back, I said, yes, of course, any question, William. <laughs> His name was, first name was William. And he said, have you thought, what will you be doing if you're not able to go back to your country? And I had the wine, I had, I was enjoying the brandy, but it was still, I felt like somebody hit me on the head with a hammer. I said, of course, what a question. Of course I'm going back. Well, what do you mean you're not going back? Uh, I left my magazines, my books, everything was side of my bed and came here and here I am. I will be going back. He said, no, 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 of course, I know you will, but let's say for whatever reason you're unable to go back. Have you thought what you would like to do? And that's when I started thinking. He, I said, well, I really don't know. He said, what are your hobbies? I said, well, I like traveling. I like photography. And I, I, I enjoy smoking cigars. He said, well, was is that travel agency maybe? Well, that's, no, travel agents, it's not my business. I just buy the ticket and I fly. So that's out of the question. Cameras, you take, uh, do you like taking photographs? Maybe a camera shop. Uh, he also represented Olympus cameras in the UK. He was their uh, legal uh, lawyer there. And I said, well, that is a thought, but I mean, I really don't know all that much about cameras to be able to have a shop for cameras, nor I, I really enjoy it all that much. I'm not passionate about it. I love taking photographs, but I'm not in love with the camera. And having said that, I do have several cameras. I am in love with the <laughs> story. <laughs> and he, he's, uh, I said, well, you know what I really love is uh, cigars. If I had to start, and I started dreaming, it's like a little boy dreaming about going to visit uh, What's that chocolate factory? Willy Wonka's, chocolate. Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. You know, the, uh, I suddenly imagine I said, what I'd love to have is like a cigar shop, like the one in Geneva, the Davidoff shop in Geneva. You walk in there, there's shelves, there's cigars, there's humidors, there's pipes. I used to smoke a lot of pipes in those days, as well as cigars. And to be honest, you know, if I had to start again, that's the sort of thing I would enjoy. In the morning, I will open the shop, walk in. And at night, I will lock it and come out. No more headaches. No worry about the ministry of this. No worry about the ministry of that. No worry about the union of the workers. No worry about the union of the engineers. Nothing, you know. I said, that's possibly. So, oh, okay. And what's that cigar you mentioned? Cigar shop in Geneva? I said, well, Davidoff. Said, do they have a shop in London? I said, no, they don't. Whenever I go to Geneva, I go there and I buy my cigars and my tobacco, the lovely Davido Scottish mixture, which I used to smoke that as well. As we're talking, he takes out his pen, he makes a note. He said, I'll write a letter to see if they want to open a shop here. I said, William, we're talking about dreams. This is nothing that is ever going to happen. No, no, Edward, I'll just write a letter and there's no charge. I'm not going to charge you for it. I'll just write a letter. What do I have to lose? You're going to write a letter. You want to write a letter? By all means, write a letter. You're not going to charge me, so it's not going to cost me anything. <laughs> I need, I need the, number, the contact of the solicitor. I would like a solicitor that doesn't take money. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was a lovely man. He is a lovely man. 42 years later, now this is early 79, 42 years later, we are very dear friends. And he's still... Uh, that, the he is, he's he's that. semi-retired, but he still might take up the client. So. <laughs> yeah. and I have to move to Eddie to ask a small question, which now, after uh, Edward's uh, essay, it seems a bit uh, that I know the answer. I wanted to ask you, Eddie, the same question now that you have the buzz and Edward doesn't know about it. It's not like you're going to ask him if you buzz this button or you don't buzz it. Discreetly. 
you are alone now. You go back. I'm not listening. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please do not do not uh, influence him now. <laughs> you end David of London and regain the lost wells. The you know we all love power, Eddie. We we all love power. I want you to to pause a bit, a moment, and answer. Davidoff, after all, is a shop, is a passion, blah, blah, blah. What's passion? I'm ba I'm, the history is taking you back to the well, to being this guy who has a private jet, probably. What would you do? Uh, this is for me or my father? Yes, oh, for Eddie. You. For me? <laughs> but, but, but He's trying press. to get out of it now. <laughs> Eddie well, didn't, but didn't press it. I want you, uh, Edward. Now, Eddie, I'm tempting you. So, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful question. My compliments on the question. And if you had asked me just before I returned to the business, because my own uh, career started, uh, my, my own working career started in the shop in the early 90s when I was clearly misbehaving at university. And uh, my father was wise enough to know I had no possibility to finish my university that time. So, I have. I come to that. <laughs> he very wisely called me home from America and, uh, and said, look, uh, you, you wasted enough of my money there. And your time. <laughs> and your time. So come back here and not... not not fully as a punishment. I think it, my father's wisdom was that I needed a, some sort of structure, something to do, something productive to be involved with. Uh, luckily, the shop was available at the time, and he said, you will come and work for me, and you will get the, the simplest wage, which was available working in the shop. And of course, the advantages are you don't pay rent, uh, you live at home, uh, of course, for an Armenian son, living at home is better than any five-star luxury hotel. Uh, you have, you know, only the Lebanese from our part of the world, the Armenians and the Italians maybe, know what a, what a mother can do for a son. So yeah. I was in the lap of luxury already. And I, was, uh, I came to the shop and it felt like I had been punished. It felt like I'd been a little bit... Um, brought down to earth. Disciplined. Disciplined and, and also uh, humbled because until then I had been able to, to, to drift through my academic life very easily and had achieved very good um, schools and universities. He was a very good student. He's, being, he's underestimating himself. No. Um... He was an excellent student. <laughs> Again, uh, <coughs> The truth is, I was extremely uh, lazy and took it for granted. So sure. the, this was a very important stage in my life, and it could have gone very bad. But thanks to my parents' wisdom, your mother, all, all the pain of that is on the shoulders of my mother, to be honest. Really? That's exactly the truth. So they brought me into work. And that first few years in the early 90s, in the cigar shop, it was um, exciting. There were, the Cigar Aficionado had, had just launched. There was a huge buzz about cigars. A day wouldn't pass in the cigar shop when someone interesting, famous, celebrity wouldn't walk in. Uh, it was always busy. And I was too naive to understand the sort of business we were doing. I took it for granted. But now when I look back, it took us 20 years to achieve what we were achieving in the 90s again. Uh, wow. My father had really gone to a level that, that I don't think most shops would have gone to in, in that period. So mm -hmm. I was lucky. I was there. Um, and, and I realized after two, three years, my father was wise. He didn't, he didn't pay me any more than, <laughs> than the lowest wage. Yeah. So my motivation suddenly arrived and my motivation was of course my peers my friends all my good friends at school were going ahead of me they were buying their first apartment they were buying a nice car 
They were achieving, you know, significant successes in their lives. And this motivated me to, to look again and say, actually, I want to also do these things. And I had a reason for wanting to do them. And that took me back to university, but here in London. Whilst I was working, I also went and did my undergraduate in, in, in London and successfully passed His it. mom said, over my dead body, you're not going back to America. <laughs> if you want to go to university, you go here. We have a university with your name. And very right to. So, so that, uh, when I, I'm sorry, it's a very long answer, but what, what it brings me to is that off the back of that university, uh, I saw my friends, the ones who were making a lot of money, were doing it in the city in the financial sector in London. So I looked through and I said, what's the quickest way for me to achieve financial success? Because that was really the metric I understood at that age. And going into the city to work in finance seemed to be the quickest way, which is where I went immediately after my, my degree. And 10 years of that, I, I did it. And it was successful. But in 2008, May 2008, it all ended. And we knew this. By this point, I was at RBS and I was uh, doing structured credit. So you can imagine the, the hurricane that hit us uh, in very quick order. And all of our jobs were, were liquidated, mine included. And at that point, my wife, I'd been, I'd become, I was married. My wife was pregnant with our first child. And I suddenly had no job, although the goodbye was a very comfortable goodbye from, from the bank. And this is, um, this is when I came back to the business. And this is when the opportunity resurfaced. And at that point, if you had asked me, Eddie, would you go back to, to Iran and fall into the lap of that luxury? Um, before I taken my first step into the shop, I would have said, yes, perfect timing. Let me go and run a huge company somewhere. But actually, what happened was even better. And I came into the shop the first day to help my father. He said, come, you're not doing anything. Come in, you know, help out a little bit at the shop whilst you look for something different to do. And that first day I walked in, it, I was more mature. I was at a different point in my life. And I could finally see and appreciate the business that was there. And what my father had done very quietly, very humbly, um, you know, at home, he would never come home and say, I am fantastic. I've sold uh, 100 boxes of cigars or, you know, <laughs> I have met Arnold Schwarzenegger or, you know, any, anything. He was very modest, but I could see what was, he was doing every day. And I could also see that to do that in any other part of life, you have to be very lucky. You have to work very hard. And even then you may not get it. So that's when I predicted it. And that's when I my answer would have changed. That's when I would have said, actually, no, I don't want today to go back. You want, you want to press the bus today. Finish. Kasem, please. Yeah. Yes. Uh, my question now for you, for you, for you, uh, Mr. Sahaki, Edward, from age 16 till 20, you had a discreet passion for pipes. You even <laughs> blended your own tobacco. Then you That's switched true. it to cigar. Partagas tubers was your first, and it was unpleasant. We know it, you it continued was tube, to but in a, It was in a glass tube. Let me correct glass that. Glass tube, yeah, sure. <laughs> we, know you, we know you continued to smoke less pipe in favor to cigars. What is the one main crucial factor that turned you to cigars? Please feel free to name as many factors, but we appreciate if you just if you may highlight the most crucial crucial one. The crucial and uh, quick answer to that is the time to smoke. If any of you, uh, I don't know if you smoke a pipe or if you're a pipe smoker or not. To smoke a pipe. You need to have time, you need to have space, you need to have all the paraphernalias. To smoke a pipe, you have to take your tobacco out, you have to fill it up, slowly get it going, light it up. You have to have a box of matches next to you, or maybe a gas lighter. 
the ashtray, and you have to be sitting down and relaxed to enjoy your pipe. You can't put your pipe in your pocket and run around and do what you're doing and just take it out of your pocket and a few puffs and put it back. You can't smoke a pipe like that. With cigars, the convenience of a cigar is, is immense. No comparison to a pipe. But there's a, I think there is a hidden factor behind that. It's not only the convenience. A pipe smoker, his character is a different character to a cigar smoker. A person who's a cigar smoker is outgoing, adventurous, enjoys the good things of life, whatever he can afford, doesn't matter. Uh, doesn't mind experimenting something new. He will go out of his way to try something different and new. If he enjoys it, he will continue. He doesn't enjoy it, he will stop. But that is the nature and the character of a cigar smoker. Pipe smoker, very conservative. He wouldn't change his brand of tobacco for anything in the world. People, they come in the shop, even today, he asks for a particular brand of a pipe tobacco. If you don't have it, he wouldn't touch anything else. He would walk out. The yeah. character of... <laughs> well, let me put it this way, without naming any names. I've had many times experiment, not experiment, experience, where a pipe smoker who is also a cigar smoker, he would come into the shop and he would want to buy a pipe. Obviously, you show him the variety of the pipes. And he would look, how much is this one? How much is that? Oh, my God, that one is 200 pounds. No, no, how much is that other one? Oh, so that one is half the price. It's 100 pounds. Something a bit less. I said, well, this one, 80 pounds. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's a nice pipe. I'll buy the 80-pound one. It's all the same, isn't it? I said, well, basically, yes. Because the pipe is the container. It's the tobacco that you put into and smoke. He said, okay, but I need some cigars as well. Let's go into the cigar room, sir. We go into the cigar. I want a few of that. Give me five of that, six of that. And give me a box of that other one as well. And we will walk out with the cigar. We come to the till. I start ringing up. Your pipe is 80 pounds, sir, and your tin of tobacco was, in those days, maybe 10, 12 pounds. That's altogether 95 pounds. And your cigars is... 250, and that's 320, and another <laughs> the total is 850. Fine, no problem. And the cigar, once he smokes it, it's gone, finished. Ash into the air, smoke, gone. The pipe will remain with him for the rest of his life and will go to his children. But that is the character of the pipe and cigar smoker in the same person. And I'm the character-wise more of a cigar smoker than a pipe smoker. <laughs> and that's at an early stage in life, I realized that, and it slowly took me away without even me knowing it. Now, looking back, I know the reason. But that was, I think, the main reason. Good answer. Very yeah. good answer, by the way. Let, 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 me, let me open a parenthesis here. I went to Vegas sometime in the early 80s. I had the chance to sit with the manager of uh, one of the casinos. And he told me that the waiters in the casino, they don't attend to pipe smokers. They will never be tipped. <laughs> but if they see somebody smoking a cigar, they will fight to serve the guy. Yeah, yeah. There is so much truth in that. So and there was an truth. Armenian manager who gave me this. He was, <laughs> was, uh, was Kait it an MGM? Kaitan Jan. I can't remember the small name. He, he, his family name is Kaitan Jan. Yeah. Excellent example. Thank you, Edward. Yeah. Second, uh... Thank you. My, my second question to Edward also, after your business trip to London near, near Christmas and after your family joining you for holiday, the political landscape has changed and you never went back except for a short trip to get personal belongings, including rice. Please... <laughs> Describe for us your mixed feelings when visiting homeland for the last time and the feeling of exile. And the question to follow, how did you bend your life, your ancestors' life, and shrunk your world from being the heir of an industrial empire to a tobacconist? Well, 
you know what? Uh, the way I was brought up in our family, in, in my family, uh, we never have had an extravagant uh, uh, lifestyle. I mean, once we went home, you know, home was home. It wasn't. It didn't matter if you had one, two, three servants or drivers, this, that, or not. It, that, that was by the way. Uh, uh, it, it, that was not difficult for me. That wasn't difficult at all. Uh, uh, when I went back, first of all, the, after it, it was a '93 when I went back, 1993, and uh, up to that point for 13, 14 years, from 1980 until 1993, I used to have nightmares, and my family knows, my wife knows, well, I used to, more or less, if not every night, every other night, I used to have nightmares. Either I've lost my passport, or I'm stuck, or I can't, I've come there, I can't go back. There was some sort of a nightmare. Yeah. When I went back, when I was in the airplane, the first time we were flying, and I took a Iran Air as well, just to get acquainted with the whole idea of it. And the plane, just before landing, I was having a nap. It was late at night. It was like 12 o'clock midnight we arrived there. When I woke up, and I'm telling myself, is this another dream, nightmare I'm having, or is this really true? And for the first time in my life, I understood when they say you pinch yourself to see if you're awake. I literally did that. Mm. I pinched myself to see if I'm awake. Uh, I went there. Uh, one thing that I more or less immediately did was like the next day or two days later, I went and saw or visited my house. Uh, and that was an experience. And I went to the house. I couldn't obviously go into the house. The house uh, was converted into a, a girls' uh, school. So, you, and, I, and no, I didn't want anybody to know that I'm there anyway. So, uh, I took a car with a friend, a friend of mine. He took me there. We stopped about 200 meters further down, came out very casually, woke up, and I just came to the, my front door. I had to touch the wall. Wow. I, st I stood there and touched the wall. several minutes. My, my hand was some sort of a vibe. And once I did that, I was comfortable. I said, let's go. Let's go. Where are we going? I said, we're going to the bazaar. We're going to do the tour of all the places I used to go. And I started dreaming about it. I want to go and live the dream. Let's go to the bazaar. We went to the bazaar. We went to the... Uh, a few of the hajis who used to sell the carpets, you know, they still remembered me, I remembered them. We sat down, we had a tea together, had a chat, and then walked all the way back to the center of the city, about an hour and a half walk. And I got that out of my system. And then we obviously tried to see if we, we were promised that we would be able to get some things back, not everything, but part of it. But that didn't happen. And I won't go into details of that, but that didn't happen. And coming back, uh, from the moment I came back from there, those nightmares of mine finished. I don't think I've ever dreamt about having gone back to Tehran, uh, or I'm stuck there, or, or whatever. Uh, oh, uh, and also, we went and do the tour of the factories. But uh, over there, again, we had to stop about 300 meters away from the factory, and I just stood there, took a few photographs. I still have the picture of the, my office from a distance with a zoom lens <laughs> hanging on the wall in the shop. And uh, a couple of restaurants, I had to go, a few of the Chalu Kababis, you know, uh, to go and see that. And then once I'm back, it's gone. It was another life. It was another chapter. And I have to say, I was one of the lucky ones. I was lucky to be able to get out of there alive, in good health. So many people that I knew, they never made it. I knew people close. One of them was a very close friend of mine. He got stuck there for no reason whatsoever. You know, 
They said, you know, you can't go, you can't go, you can't go. He stayed there that long. He got ill. They put him in jail for a while. He got sick in the jail. By the time he came out, they finally said, okay, you can go. He got his tickets, everything. He had a heart condition already. Got onto the plane, came to Germany to change planes and come to London to see a specialist in Germany. His heart stopped and he died there. Let's yeah. pull you out the sadness. I'm sorry to ask you that. Yeah, it's no sadness. It's reality and it's all, but, it's, but, it's water passed under the bridge. So I don't mind talking about it at all. <laughs> I want to go to that. Great. Extent. I'm very sorry, Edward. We, we, yeah. we pressed the wrong this button. This is the sad part. We could talk about the happy yes. side. The thing yes, that yeah. I... Well, Eddie, question two. A heavy one. In an article in Forbes on June 23rd, 2016, Nick Passmore wrote that by virtue of Edward's long and dear relationship with Hunters and Francal, Edward got the privilege to pick the best of Cuban boxes, better even than the boxes one can buy in Havana. Nick continues to mention an incident of buying a Cohiba Siglo 4 from Edward, where the best he ever smoked versus a boat, a box boat in Havana, while enjoyable, were nowhere near the same experience. The question is, are Hunters and Francao favored by Habanos to choose the best? And you gentlemen, are favored by the favored? Is it true that some areas, regions, distributors have privilege over other distributors? Would it be ethical from Habanos' side if this is true? Well, uh, I, I will tell you the official uh, response to that. It is not true. Everybody is treated equally. Right? I've asked we'll, this question we'll many the official answer. And it is not true. However, in practice, I'll tell you exactly how it happens. Hunters of Franco, at the moment, it's run by a lovely, uh, charming young lady, Gemma Freeman. Uh, when I started buying my cigars, it was run by her father, uh, Nicholas, Nicholas or Nick Freeman. Nick yes. Freeman was the fifth generation. Gemma is the sixth generation. Their, their relationship well, goes back way, way before all the uh, changes in Cuba, before Castro and long before that. Uh, if you are a company dealing with another company who they rely on you buying their products, for six or five generations. Obviously, you will look after them in a different way than a person who, for the first time, walks in through the door. You've never met him before. He has all the cash in the briefcase, but there are things that money cannot buy. There are relationships you cannot purchase with money. There are relationships that you cannot put value on it. You can't say that this relationship is worth that many cigars or that many pounds or that many uh, euros. Uh, their relationship is much more deeper than, uh, uh, than all that. Uh, if you ask me, my personal opinion is the UK market in general, which is really represented by now hunters, in the early years, it, there were three companies we used to buy cigars from. There was Knight Brothers who had Romeo and Juliet. There was... Uh, uh, I forgot, I forgot the name. The other one, they used to have the Hoya de Montreux, and there was Hunters, uh, Hunters and Franco, who had uh, both them all. The Upmans and Davidoff as well. Don't forget, they, they, they were uh, the UK agents for the Davidoff, the Cuban Davidoffs. Yes. Yeah. And uh, now, of course, the, all of it is Hunters and Franco, and their relationship uh, goes much deeper. Uh, when we go there, and we're very fortunate, we get invited by uh, Miss, Mrs. Freeman, and she takes us there, and we walk into some factories, you see the, the older generation of uh, the su superiors or executives, or even people working there, they come to her, oh, how is your father? They remember the father, they remember even the grandfather, uh, Robert Freeman, you know, it, it was... Uh, these relationships uh, exist. Yeah. Uh, does England get uh, better quality? Yes, I think they do. This is my personal opinion. 
uh, and it is based on fact. Then the fact is, you go and buy cigars in France, and buy France uh, cigars in uh, Spain, uh, other countries, uh, and you buy the same cigar here. Somehow it, it is different. Uh, I know that Lebanon now is more closer to England than the other countries because now you get some fantastic cigars in Lebanon. But again, for this reason, because you know it takes time. Uh, relationships, uh, you cannot put it in a microwave and cook it very quickly. It needs time and you cannot uh, rush into creating close relationships. You cannot buy close relationships. Uh, Time is probably the most expensive and yet the most cheapest element in life that brings people and brings relationships together. And yeah. yes, I, I will openly say, my, to my opinion, definitely to my opinion, we get the best cigars here. We do get sometimes not very good cigars. That happens. Uh, but in general, in total, we get some very, very good cigars, as you do. Next, uh, I have something for you, Eddie. It's rather not a question. It's more an opinion, and I would like to have your opinion on that opinion. Uh, in one of your interviews, Eddie, you raised a huge worrying issue, and I quote, we are at a very interesting inflection point where people are quite divided between analog and digital. And you continue, I wonder if there is room in the modern world for bricks and mortar old school retailer in the world of luxury cigars. I certainly hope that there is. Personally, Eddie, if we come to a day where there is no room for brick and mortar in cigars, lounges replaced by Zoom, flagship shops replaced by online, I would feel sad, very sad, and I would surely resist it as long as I breathe. What do you think? I, I will be on the same uh, side of the battle as you. I will also resist that. And I have to say, since, since those worries were aired, um, what I have seen in the last three, four, five years has given me huge reassurance. Because certainly in the early 2000s, we were seeing a decline in the number of people and the age profile of the typical cigar smoker. Uh, and this was true across tobacco. So we worried. And we weren't seeing the young people coming into cigars the way we would hope, the way it would re replenish and re-energize the industry. But in the last five, six years, not only on the business side, but more importantly on the customer side, uh, a day does not pass where we are not visited by young, and when I say young, I mean 20, 21, 22, 23, that sort of age profile, <coughs> newly energized people who have touched us first online. They have watched your beautiful interviews. They have read something online that we have said maybe. They have studied the history and notice that we are a small part of that history in London. And that has not been the end of their journey. That has been the reason they have started the journey. And it's given them the courage to take the next step, which is to come and visit us and walk through the front door. And when they do that, the experience 99% of the time they tell us is we love the shop. You must never stop being a shop. You cannot only be digital. And this is coming from the very people who embrace digital for everything else in their life. They love it. We love it because we see them growing like a flower, blossoming in front of our eyes. My father has the advantage of seeing often the son or even the grandson of some of his customers. These are the young people coming in. Sometimes there's no family history. But they come in, they are emboldened, they are energized. They give us an opportunity to look after them in the way that only a bricks and mortar retailer can look after a customer. Nothing beats shaking someone's hand, looking them in the eyes, having a conversation, adapting to their body language, and showing the deference and the respect for the customer 
which every customer should expect when they walk into a shop. But so few shops understand that nuance. And in our business, in our world, it is the very reason we exist. It is built into, you know, as Armenians, as, as Lebanese, as Middle Easterns, our, our philosophy of life, our ethics is built around welcoming your guest and valuing your guest as the most important person in your house. Not the house owner, but your guest. And we live exactly by those rules in our shop. And because of that, we create relationships and we create experiences. Everyone talks about experiences today, but what we do is natural. It is not a contrived experience. It is purely doing what we're meant to be doing. And they walk away with a big smile on their face. And when they walk out with a smile, I have an even bigger smile on my face. I know my father does too. So I think that's probably my opinion on it as we stand today. Guests, no customers. They are guests, no customers. Customers. They are guests, not customers. Yeah, but before I ask my question, just to mention, it's an excellent cigar, by the way. Thank just you. Just want to thank you guys on this cigar. It's an excellent cigar. Thank you We're so delighted much. you're enjoying it, Kassim. Excellent. My question it's even more delicious now that we are talking to each other. <laughs> yeah. Well, that is, now, there's so much truth in it. You know, a cigar, yeah. uh, when you're smoking cigar, sharing a cigar, in good company, it, it, it tastes different. It, yeah. it, it, the same cigar smoked somewhere else under different circumstances might not be pleasant at all. And yet, at the right circumstances, in the right company, at the right time, it, it's delicious. Because it's not only the cigar, it's the memories. It, it's yeah. uh, the, the company that counts. That and the company, of course. And, and it's, it's, there's so much truth in that. Yeah. My question to you, Edward, also, and excuse me for my question, you said once that you should dress properly, properly, tie, suit, and shape to welcome your customer. But now, as we can see, you let your bird on, your bird on. so what changed your mind? What <laughs> made you lay down your shiny arms and grow long your beard? Your beard? Well, excuse uh, me again for my question, but circumstances, my friend, <laughs> circumstances. <laughs> for a number of months, we couldn't open the shop, as you all know. Uh, by the order of the government, we had to stay shut, uh, locked down. And uh, whilst you're at home, you get a bit lazy, of course. Uh -huh. so one day I didn't shave. I said, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to the shop. It's all right if I don't shave today. I asked my wife, you don't mind if I don't shave? Said, no, but you're not going it to. It suits you, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and then the second day, third day. And then, of course, in the meantime, I realized Eddie is also not shaving. <laughs> well, you know, if he's at <laughs> my age and he could get away with it, maybe I could get away with it. And then after a while, you get used to it. And if I had to shave it off today, I will miss doing this. I will miss doing uh, this, you know. <laughs> and, and also, and still... I, I look a bit older, and with that, it brings a bit more respect. You will not uh, believe it that uh, before this uh, uh, lockdown period, a few times I, I sort of jumped on the bus uh, because I'm just two bus or three bus stops away from the shop. And I would just jump on the bus to come home in the afternoons. And I walked into the bus and then a young lady or a gentleman, they would stand up, sir, would you like to sit down? And the first time that happened to me, I really <laughs> thought, you know, age is catching up with me, but also I'm giving the appearance of an older man. <laughs> And so by it the way, have other advantages as well. <laughs> yeah, but by the way, by the way, even with the beard on, you're still a true gentleman, according to the to the interview. My question also to you both now, you probably have heard this question over and over. Your favorite Cuban cigar and your favorite New World cigar. This question goes to you, Edward and Eddie. Please name your favorite one. I'll go first. 
because that's very easy. Okay. Favorite, and I suppose we are talking about current production. Yes. yes. Because things exactly. you cannot get, you cannot get. That's history. Exactly. Or if you can, they're very rare. But uh, over here we have something, there's a program on radio called the Desert Iron. So every time, every week they bring somebody and they ask a uh, celebrity or somebody famous and they say, if you're going to a desert island and you're going to be there all on your own, what food you would like to take with you? What would you like to drink there? What sort of a music would you like to hear there? And he would say, I would like to hear Chopin. I would like to hear this. I would like to hear that singer. And they start playing the music accordingly. So they asked me, said, what would your desert island cigar be? If I was going to go to a, an island all on my own, nothing else to do, uh, what is the single one cigar that I will be allowed to take with me? And my answer is, Hoya de Monterey, double Corona in bundles of 50. One box of that will take yeah. me a long, long way. <laughs> I cannot agree with you more. That is my cue. It's my favorite also. On the other side, that's a bit more difficult. There are two cigars I would have to think before I decide which one I'm taking with me. My first obvious choice would be the David of number two from Dominican Republic, which is exactly the same shape. Well, it's exactly what we're smoking, slightly different blend, because obvious. this, was a, this yeah. blend of yeah. this was extraordinary. Yeah. But... Uh, uh, David of number two, also, also, I've started recently enjoying the <laughs> Winston Churchill, no, 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 the Winston huh. Churchill late hour. Oh. The late hour, the Robusto, the smaller size. Having said that, even the Churchill one is, it's a delicious blend. We, we have so, a review on YouTube about the cigar. We have a review on YouTube. On David of we, did, hour. we did a review on the Robusto uh, Church. Late, and the late hour. Number two. Which and rank the the number two. Yeah, I mean, to, to, for everybody's got a different palate, of course, but for my palate, that is a delicious, uh, really nice uh, uh, cigar. So here yeah. you are. That's my answer. Now your turn, Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> I, on the Cuban side, Again, many, many choices. If, if I can stretch deeply enough into my father's private locker, uh, <laughs> I will take with me the Siglo 6 Grand Reserva. Oh. Uh, if you find it. That's playing but dirty, Eddie. It. I know. I know. But You're let's, hitting behind let's the make it fairer. I will take a, even a Siglo 6 with five to eight years of age. Okay. Even this is a beautiful cigar and uh, for me the perfect expression of why people fall in love with cuban cigars um it's as we all know i've i've yet to have one when i have not sat back looked at the cigar and said my god this is perfection so that's an easy one for the non-cuban my father's opinion I share, the number two I'm very fond of. But in recent two, three years, I have been smoking much more the Davidoff, the Nicaragua box press Toro. Ah, and, good. you know, I always thought it was a gimmick, the box press. Uh, Padron, they do this all the time. But when Davidoff first did it, they, they released the Nicaragua, which was a good cigar. Then they brought out the Box Press Robusto and the Box Press Toro, ostensibly the same blend. But in that shape, it is magical. And I call my Box Press Toro the great leveler. Because whenever a customer walks in, especially my older customers, and they say, I only smoke Cuban. That's all I will ever smoke. None of this New World rubbish. I say to them, sir, Here's a box press Nicaragua and Toro. Take it home, smoke it. It's a gift from me. You don't have to pay for it. If you don't like it, don't worry. Never buy one. If you do like it, just do me the honor. Come back and buy one. They always come back and buy one. <laughs> and they always tell me it's 
It's a profoundly good cigar. <laughs> <laughs> good good uh, strategy. <laughs> I have to move to one question, Eddie, which is a bit sensitive. You have the privilege not to answer if you feel offended. But I have to ask. Let's face it, the naked truth, I'm talking to Eddie, is that you were guided into the cigar business, not by passion, nor by self-determination, but by a sequence of imposed incidents. At 16 years old, you were forced by Edward to smoke your first cigar, wrongly thinking you were secretly smoking. You were not. You were that called was, back from so the US. Fine. You were called back from the US where you were assumably pursuing education. You joined the banking industry, and if not of the 2008 financial meltdown, and having found yourself jobless, Eddie Sahagian would possibly have never been a tobacconist. My question is, will you, Eddie, live continually in the shadow of Edward? Will you, Eddie, be good enough to build, create, establish your own legacy away from the influence, the sway and the dominance of Edward? Do you have the flame that Edward had and still has? You may not answer. We move to another question. I, I, will, I will certainly answer as honestly as I can. And uh, the, the, the honest truth is, I don't know where I will go. What I can say is the passion is there now. And my love for the cigar is built not like my father. His love began entirely his, on his own. It, it happened personally, outside of his family influence. Mine started in the very fertile soil of my father's influence, of course. So I was already pushed in this direction. However, I am also a very stubborn character. And there is only so far I can go without loving something. And I'm old enough now to to have understood those choices in life. And it's only looking back that I understand those choices. I didn't make them the way my father did. I didn't make them because my passion was there. I made them out of necessity. But when I look back, I think how lucky I am that I was pushed into those choices because now I love the cigars. Now I love the business. I love my customers. I love everything that my father has built. And my challenge, and it's not, there has, the answer has not come yet, but my challenge will be to add something to the wonderful building my father has constructed of his love of cigars. And if I can do that, I will be a very happy man. If I can sit where my father is today in, in 30 years' time, um, and have achieved even half of his achievements in the cigar world, I know I will have done wonders. So it's a, it's, a, it's a living challenge for me, but I hope I will be up to it. Thank you for your honesty, but let me tell you my naked opinion about you, Eddie. You will be... That's not... The question does not reflect my opinion of you. I am... I'm, I'm... I believe in you, and I think you will get to much higher levels. I'm, I'm pretty sure. N next question. Can I just add before please, we go to the next please, question? You may do he it. He's already miles ahead of me. His youth, his knowledge, his memory, his ability, and his judgment is by far, by far better than mine. This is not true, but only a father can say this. That's the love of the father. And, and I am he so loves proud. you, Eddie. I am so <laughs> proud that he is now running the business. Uh, I go there and I come back, but he's the one who actually runs it. He's the boss, and he's doing a fantastic job. There's difficult issues sometimes come up. Basically, it's relationships. And his judgment is by far, by far better than mine. And he says, oh, Dad, what do you think? Should we do it that way? I said, Eddie, 
you know much better how to do it than I do. Go ahead and do any way you want to. There is this element of father and son working together. And this will, again, only those who had the experience to either they work with their father or they're working with their son will understand what I'm saying. But it, it could be magical, it could be disastrous. I, I'll share, uh, maybe I should, no, I will say it, it's, it's all gone now. But uh, I grew up in a family where myself, my brother and my father, and my brother and my father, they always disagreed on everything, even the things they agreed on, they disagreed on, for whatever reason. And I never had that problem with my father. Maybe I had the experience of seeing what's right and what's wrong, or how one could go around it rather than try to push a wall back. You could just go around it, open the door and go in. And I used to always do that. And if the door was closed, I would go through the window. It didn't matter. I never had a problem working with my father. And I tried to remember the good and the bad. And when now I have the pleasure and the privilege of uh, working with Eddie, because I'm working with him now, rather than him working <laughs> with me. Uh, we, uh, we have a lovely relationship. It's a, it's a pure joy and pure pleasure. He's still so respectful. If I walk into the room, he would still stand up. He doesn't need to do that. He doesn't, I didn't even want him to do that, but he does. And he would stand up and he's trained his children. His son does the same as well. He's only 12 years old, but you know, I go to the room, he stands up, comes to me, hugs me. Uh, and uh, I'm so happy to see that the tradition is continuing. And uh, he's great. So he is way ahead of me, my dear friend. <laughs> good, good. Great. great. I shift, I shift, the sh I, 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 I turn the page. I have a question and an opinion. I don't know where I stand on this, but I would like to ask you, gentlemen, what is your very transparent opinion on the new David of Lines, the discoveries, the Yamasa, the Escurio, and the Nicaragua? I know you... You like the Nicaragua box press. Personally, I think they are good cigars, but they lack the DNA of Davidoff. What do you think? Well, I'm very happy they finally decided to take the plunge into Nicaragua. For a number of years, I used to suggest to them, that, why don't you use Nicaragua tobacco? I had smoked Nicaraguan cigars. You could see the potential in the very early days when I opened the shop. There was a cigar we used to get. It was called the Hoya de Nicaragua. It was produced in Nicaragua, sold in the UK, uh, very cheap. It was one third of normal sized cigars. And but you could see that that tobacco had potential to it. And uh, when Davidoff eventually decided to start using Nicaragua tobacco, I was very happy, and to me, uh, the Nicaraguan blends are delicious. Uh, some of the other ones that they do, I find some of the Davidoff cigars a bit uh, overpowering for my palate, and it's entirely a matter of palate. In the same manner, I love the number two because it's mild, it's smooth, it's easy to smoke. Uh, the Chef's Edition, which is a great cigar, but I find it a bit overpowering. The latest one, the Dominica, uh, Dominicana. The Dominicana one. It was a very nice cigar, but it's not a cigar I will smoke every day. It's too powerful for my palate. But that's my opinion. Eddie, you? Uh, well, uh, it, it's, it's a very interesting question for me because, of course, what matters is what the customers ultimately buy and what they want to continue to buy. And I can tell you that the probably of the three, the Escurio is the one um, that is least bought uh, in my shop. And I think the reason for that is the, the, perhaps the reason why Davidoff first did the Yamasa and the Escurio. And I think it was more a proof of concept. I think in the case of the Yamasa, Henke Kellner had spent a good 20 years turning a oh. part of soil, basically, that was ungrowable 
It was a swamp. Sorry? It was a swamp. Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, and, but he, he, he turned it in 20 years from a entirely unfriendly field for tobacco to a field that can create some of the most powerful Dominican leaf I've ever smoked, hence the Yamasa. And the Yamasa was Henke and Davidoff saying, we can also do very strong. We can also take something undoable and make it doable. And so I respect them hugely for that. And some of the Yamasa leaf, the tobacco, when blended with some of the other Dominican and Nicaraguan blends is magical. On its own, as a puro, a, just a straightforward Yamasa, it's too strong for my palate as well. I find it overpowering. Mm -hmm. For me, the Escurio is my least favorite, probably, simply because I don't enjoy the profile of the Brazilian tobacco in there. I find it extremely salty on my palate. Uh, and so I think the Escurio was another example of Davidoff saying, okay, give us a challenge. Everyone says Brazilian tobacco is cheap, shouldn't be used in high quality cigars. We're gonna make a high quality cigar with Brazilian tobacco. Okay. And they did. It is still a high quality cigar, but you are right. It is a very, very long distance from what I and you and us might call a Davidoff cigar in flavor profile. Exactly. Um, Thank you. Excellent answer. Thank you. Ex uh, Question. Question uh, now, gentlemen. Yours or okay. mine? Mine, mine. April, April 15, 2014. Simon Chase smoked with you, Edward Lahoyo de Gourmet, a size that measures 170 millimeter by 33 ring gauge. In his article, Simon teased you, Eddie, saying that people who smoke cigar of a traditional ring gauge behave better than those who smoke a uh, 50 ring gauge or more. And Simon observed you both, Edward, you were smiling, Eddie frowned. The <laughs> question now is, what is your opinion on big ring gauge cigar, meaning slender and long versus fat and short? And this for you two uh, gentlemen. Well, there's no secret. I'm no great fan of the large ring gauge cigars for several reasons, but one of the main reasons, I find it, I mean, uh, even a Robusto these days is not a large ring gauge cigar anyway, but even smoking a Robusto or anything beyond that, 52, 54 ring gauges, after a while, I feel a pain in my jaw. Because oh. I tend, when I smoke a cigar, I tend to put the cigar in my mouth and use my hands. And to hold that in my mouth, it becomes painful. I need okay. to stretch my mouth to accommodate a 54 ring gauge in my mouth comfortably and cover it with my lips to be able to draw the smoke out of it. Okay. Uh, uh, to me, the Hoya de Gourmet, it's a beautiful cigar. It's the same as the David of 3000. Uh, it, it might be slightly too slender, but it's a lovely cigar. Uh, my ideal is uh, any cigar to me shouldn't really be more than 40, 42 ring gauge of uh, size. Uh, the length, four or five inches, six inches. Uh, one of my favorites was always uh, uh, the David of number one or the Cohiba Lancero. It's a perfect size. Uh, I, I do cheat sometimes, and it, again, it's no secret. Uh, when I, I take the for instance, the Lancero or the number one, I cut one third of it off in the morning from the end and I start smoking that. Yeah. And uh, with a quick espresso, maybe a bit of a walk outside the shop. And then in the afternoon, I light up the other two thirds and it becomes uh -huh. perfect. <laughs> but that's, that's me. For business. <laughs> but for business to teach uh, young generation. The young generation should learn all the good things, all the bad things as well, but also all the good things. You know, uh, people ask me, can I keep the cigar overnight and smoke it tomorrow? And for business, I should say, no, 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 never do that. I tell them, yes, you can do it. But there are ways of doing that. 
Uh, I do it all yeah. the time. Every, the amount of times, uh, if, if our conversation finished tonight and my cigar is this much left, I will never ever throw that away. I'll show you exactly what I do. I will flick the ash off, blow the smoke out a few times, leave it in an ashtray outside in a covered area. Next morning when I pick it up, and I do pick it up on my way to, to work, I light it up. The first two puffs, no more than that, slightly bitter, it doesn't bother me. On the third, fourth puff, it's as good as it was last night. Don't you, oh. don't you cut uh, one inch or half inch of the burnt uh, area? The only time I cut the end of the cigar is if I'm going into a shop and I don't have an extra empty tube in my pocket. <laughs> okay, okay. Then I cut it and put it in my pocket. <laughs> oh, okay. Because my wife gets angry when she finds the ash in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Eddie. Eddie. Yes. So <laughs> it, it is true. Your 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 observation uh, of of that lovely conversation with with Simon uh, is, is right. And and uh, I have more uh, more friendship with the heavier ring gauges. Uh, but even even for me, um, anything more than a fifty four ring gauge is not uncomfortable in the way my father finds it because I I do less. When I'm smoking, I tend to be more focused on the cigar, less on what I'm doing otherwise. So I'm not holding it in the mouth as much as he will. Um, so I find it easier to smoke the big ring gauges. The difficulty I face with, with the very big ring gauges, 55, 58, 60, is they are overwhelming. And more often than not, I will feel like I have enjoyed too much of the cigar before I finish it. Mm -hmm. And I hate to waste a cigar. Uh, it's, that comes from my father as well. To leave a cigar that has not been smoked to the very, very end is haram, almost. <laughs> so <laughs> so yeah. this, is, this is where I, I agree with my father, you know, with the slimmer ring gauge and the more traditional slender sizes, you're far less likely to, to be unable to finish it. Uh, but I have experienced some beautiful, thick, heavy ring gauge cigars. And if I wasn't worried about the waste and I didn't feel guilty about leaving one third behind, often they smoke cooler and they smoke with more um, pure flavor Ar aromatic than more. a slim cigar. Um, so we will differ a little bit still on, on that opinion. But uh, I am moving towards slimmer gauges as I get older. That's for sure. We are yeah. we're all yeah. doing this. The all advantage of a large ring gauge cigar, there are many advantages. Uh, the, the most important advantage is the larger the ring gauge, they are able to blend more varieties yes. of tobacco in it. Exactly. And that is, exactly. That is a the blend is. one of the beauties of a large ring gauge cigar. Exactly. Uh, exactly. But in them, uh, as Eddie said, you know, when I leave home, I rarely leave home without having a cigar on me. Or when I come back home and I need to do something. If I start physically doing something, I have to have a cigar in my mouth, in my hand, or in my pocket. It's comforting to know it's there. I might not smoke it, oh, okay. but it's comforting <laughs> to know it's there. It calms you. Yeah. It does, oh, absolutely. But well, that's what the cigar does anyway. Right? When we smoke a cigar, the most uh, uh, fascinating bit of the cigar is it's a relaxing air exercise. You exactly. smoke a cigar, you relax. Exactly. When you're 100%. feeling relaxed, your blood pressure is down. When your blood pressure is down, your heart beats slower. And when your heart beats slower, you live to be much longer. 100 I... years old, plus. Perhaps <laughs> even 150, you said at the beginning. <laughs> Hopefully. Okay, Edward, you have been you have been stalking slash aging cigars for forty years now, mostly for investment and some for your personal pleasure. I reckon the question is: among those hundreds of boxes you have purchased, were there any bad investment? Some that didn't age well, 
boxes that you bought at high prices and cannot get the face value today? I have never bought a cigar that has lost its value. Never. 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 Not me. Anybody, anybody would have bought cigars 20 years ago, that same cigar, if he sells it today, he would not lose money on that. Uh, for pure fact, every year, every year the government has automatically worked into their budget. Whenever they announce the budget on tobacco products, there's always an increase, two, three, four, sometimes 5% increase. So the price doesn't drop. It keeps on going up. Uh, yes, I have uh, bought cigars, and I probably still have maybe some, which are not perfect, but they are much better than what they were 25 years ago. The value of it is worth much more now than what I paid for it then. Uh, on the other hand, of course, there are cigars that I wish I'd bought everything because, you know, it's just unbelievable. You know, the prices, you cannot even put value on them anymore. If I had more of the David of Dom Perignons, I would be very happy, but... <laughs> Who doesn't? Who doesn't, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> a question uh, a bit uh, personal, uh, human, if you want. I want to bring up the uh, name William Hurt, the solicitor. Yes. Part of the legacy, maybe tiny, but still a part. He who dragged you as a figure of speech to open the shop. He who insisted to repeatedly write, repeatedly write to Davidoff and pursued the franchise. He who arranged the meeting with Dr. Schneider and attended it and made your dream come true. That was his job, but we all wonder who truly is William. Why there is no photo of him? Does he smoke cigars? Tell us about William Hurt, please, Edward. William, he did not smoke cigars, and possibly the first cigar he smoked was on that first lunch we had together. And even then, I don't think he finished the cigar. <laughs> uh, he did smoke cigars. He's not a regular smoker, but he does occasionally smoke a cigar. Uh, I mean, he's a dear, dear friend. Uh, first of all, he didn't drag me into the Davidoff shop. He pushed me. I'll, I'll tell you a little uh, anecdote about that. Is you know, We all know where Niagara Falls is in America. You know, the beautiful water, the falls coming. And every year, Millions of people go there and they stand right at the edge of the falls and they watch all this water coming down. And whilst this is happening, one woman suddenly falls, misses her step, she falls into the lake down there. Next thing they see, another man, zoom, after her, goes there, grabs hold of her, the helicopters come, the boats come, everything, they pull them up. As the helicopter is putting him down, the reporters run to him, Sir, 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 what is your name? You're a hero. You saved that woman's life. What is your name? Please give us your name. He says, forget my name. I want to go and find the name of the guy who pushed me there. <laughs> In this case, you know the guy. Pushed me. He didn't drag me. He pushed me into it. <laughs> you, know, you, know, you know the guy. <laughs> and I, I know his name. His name is William Hurt. Uh, he, he's a fascinating gentleman. I mean, uh, he, he's a very successful lawyer. I can't say much about him. I don't know if he would be happy about it or not. But, you know, at the end, uh, he was so good at his work that uh, a private client uh, took him uh, full time to be only his solicitor. And he convinced him to make him an offer he couldn't refuse convinced him to resign from the uh, firm that he was working for, which he was a partner by then, and totally worked for him. And uh, he said, well, I will relinquish all my directorships, I will relinquish everything, but there's only one company I will have to stay because I promised him I will look after him. And that is Davidoff, the shop in London. 
Luckily, the person who was negotiating with him, he was a cigar lover. He said, oh, Davidov, no problem. That you can keep. <laughs> and he you can keep. stayed faithful to that right up to today. Good. Great. Nice story. Uh, may, I, may I add also that um, William is a dear friend to my father, but also to, to the family. Uh, and I have had the pleasure of knowing him now almost as long as my father, as a child first and now as, a, as, as, a, as an adult right in business. Yes. yes. And even to this very day, um, when we have an important decision or we need some really significant wisdom, the only other person I ask, apart from my family, is William. Wow. And, uh, and I know he will tell me the truth, but he will also care. And, uh, and this is a testament to the man. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me add one other thing. You know, again, you will understand uh, what I'm saying. Some of our viewers might not, but we believe in, uh, in faith and also some people uh, in life, like the, it applies more to doctors, perhaps. There are doctors that uh, even with the worst health condition, you go to him because, you know, if you go to this doctor, he will put you right. He could never do something wrong. And you, no. you, you trust him with all your heart and your soul. Uh, William is one of those people. I mean, whenever there was I mean, even the biggest problems or whatever, uh, I said, I don't know what will happen. My wife would say, talk to William. If he tells you what to do, listen to him. You can't go wrong. And it's always been like that. He's that sort of a figure. We all have friends, lawyers, doctors, whatever, who fit into that category. We had a doctor for 40, 42 years, Dr. Gormley, bless him. For 42 years, we were his patient. He retired last year. And no matter whatever the uh, illness or the problem was, we always go to Dr. Gormley knowing that he will put it right. No worries. The moment you walked into his cabinet, already you felt that you're half better. <laughs> you, you, you will feel better, right? My question now, it might sound the silliest question, but bear, bear with me, guys. What is the thing about the umbrellas behind you every time you go on video? I read it says well, I mean the umbrella. But why shooting videos and the umbrellas are behind you? Excuse me again for my question. Two, two answers, and I think I should answer that because even Eddie wasn't involved when I started with the umbrellas. When I opened the shop in, in the early days, in the first six, seven months, you know where our shop uh, is, uh, you know, St. James's Street on the corner of German Street. And we're blessed with a number of gentlemen's clubs there. I mean, it's the heart of the club land, they say. We have White's Club, we have uh, Brooks Club, we have uh, Carlton Club, we have uh, well, there's club after club after club. And the, all the members, they have from different uh, groups of society there. One is only for the conservatives, one is only for the lords, the other one's only for... Uh, well, I don't think they the labor. <laughs> <laughs> but they, 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 each one is specialized clubs, they are. And we used to get these lovely gentlemen all dressed up walking, you know, do, do you have umbrellas? I said, no, sir, we're, we're a cigar shop. We don't have umbrellas. Well, we have a cigar shop. Uh, traditionally, I used to always buy my umbrellas from a cigar shop. What sort of a cigar shop are you? We don't have umbrellas. And what about walking sticks? And one of them, I got to be a bit more friendly. I said, when you say tradition, you said, yeah, well, yes, very much so. Every tobacconist, it was known that you would buy your walking stick or your umbrella from your local tobacconist. You would have it. And I said, well, well, why not? Let's try, you know. We want to look like a traditional tobacconist. And uh, asked a few questions. And who's the best umbrella maker in, in England? Two, three people I asked, they all said the same thing. There's a company called Fox Umbrellas. We bought six umbrellas from them. The rep came along, so on six umbrellas. What do you want? Traditional, well, traditional, the black with the, 
handles and whatever, and to sit somewhere else, put it there, and to make the container a bit more filling, like a, a bunch of flowers. We added a few walking sticks to it as well. I think we, we had all together six umbrellas and six walking sticks. And I put in the corner of the shop just to say, yes, we do have them. There it is. Well, I, it didn't take more than a few weeks. The 12 had come down to three or four. And I said, well, Judy, I think we need to get some more umbrellas. And some more umbrellas it became. More umbrellas and more walking sticks. The more umbrellas we had, the more we sold it. And then Judy said, what about ladies' umbrellas? Let's get some... Ladies' umbrellas, they make some beautiful, furly ladies' umbrellas. But well, ladies, they don't use umbrellas. Of course they do. You know, when they go to the horse races and whatever, it doesn't matter. Even if it's not raining, they like to hold an umbrella. And it, it's a very interesting part of our business. Why is it in the, uh, <laughs> in the videos? Because that's where the two famous seats are. <laughs> and we don't have any other place to keep the umbrellas. That's the only <laughs> wall we have to put on. Like you see it all the time. <laughs> only by chance, then. <laughs> only by chance. But obviously, it has worse. See, everybody's talking about the umbrellas now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Intriguing. But it's incredible. Yeah. I had one gentleman two years ago. He walked in. He bought 18 umbrellas at one go. 18? Oh. 18 umbrellas. And they're not the cheap ones. Huh? They're, they were well over 200 pounds each. Wow. wow. So it was as good as selling cigars, maybe even better. The margin is much better than umbrellas. That I say, my <laughs> friend. <laughs> good for you. <laughs> my question, Eddie, for you now. Now, when you look back at the experience working on and off with your father, father, would you encourage your son to follow your footsteps or his grandfather? And if not, and the day comes when there is no successor to you, would you sell the business like Zino Davidov sold the Davidov Geneva? Ooh, I, I, I would dearly hope um, my son or my daughter, she's younger, she's nine, my son is 12, either one or both of them, I would hope if they have an interest in what we do, that they would come and work with me. That would be a dream. But I would feel no... I would. Uh, put no pressure on them for that. I would want them to, to come to it as naturally as, as is appropriate in their life. After they got their proper education. After they've had their education, of Definitely. course. Uh, so that, that, yes, that would be a big dream. But if, if that didn't happen and I got to the, uh, to, to, to the point in my life when I could no longer work and I still have a successful business, uh, then, of course, the, the next question would be, what do I do with that business? If there is no obvious successor to, to follow, follow in the footsteps, then, uh, then I, would, I would be open, to, of course, to, to find someone perhaps who can take it on uh, to the next level. Uh, I hope that day is long, long, long away. <laughs> we hope and, and we hope that day will never come. We hope that your children will follow you. <laughs> Thank you. God willing, these children will sell cigars to your grandchildren. <laughs> and they will oh, smoke. Lovely. Much younger than Eddie. I'm all, we're both older. <laughs> uh, that's, that's a bit of a sentimental question. I mean, there are similarities between your path, Edward, in the world of cigar and Zeno's. I would like to simplify the formula and say you differ from Zeno in two things. A, you flew from Tehran while Zeno took the train from Ukraine. That's a joke. B, you didn't make your own cigar. One thing you cannot alter, the airplane. Making your own cigar is something you still can. Why you don't? I've been tempted and asked that many times. And, you know, these days, uh, it's not too difficult to have a cigar with your name on it. But I always feel if I ever had a cigar with my name on it, I cannot be unbiased then. If a cigar has got my name on it, I would have to say this is the best cigar. Where else? Now, 
I'm a, a unbiased uh, smoker. If a cigar is good, I can say it's good. If it's not good, I can say it's not good. And it doesn't bear my name, so I will have no obligation. It's like a football uh, team and people who are supporters of football. I don't support any one particular team. I enjoy watching all the matches, and whoever's playing better, I happy for them. It's the same with the cigars. Uh, who I, uh, I mean, we've been tempted many, many times, and it's so easy to have a cigar with your name on it. But if I ever do that, I will never do it. Uh, I don't know about Eddie or even Elvis, my grandson. But uh, if you have a cigar with your name on it. Uh, even if it's the best cigar in the world, it will be only the best cigar to your opinion and to opinion of your other people. But the world opinion will differ. Uh, I'd rather sit on the sideline and be an unbiased observer or an unbiased taster and decide which is good and which is not good. That's the reason I have not done it. But Eddie, Eddie, you can make a good cigar and still be unbiased and say that's a good cigar. This is a challenge. Yes, uh, and who knows? Perhaps in, in, in the future, um, I think I think if if you're lucky, uh, you will. I, I in general, you can meet someone, and the relationship between the grower, the roller, and the retailer has to be magical. I think uh, there are some very good growers, there are some very good producers. Uh, of course, there's good retailers. If we were to do that, if we were ever to do that, it would have to be uh, an act of love. Uh, it, we would have to find a kindred spirit in the, in the tobacco production world who would uh, embody all our values, everything that we believe in as a cigar retailer, they would have to have that in what they make, what they grow, how they look after it. And if one day those ingredients are in place and the opportunity is there, uh, maybe. Hopefully. We are lo all looking forward to that day. Thank you. <laughs> The last from our side before we start the questions of our friends and members. Uh, sorry, Qasim left us. We will wait till he rejoin. He has taken a comfort break. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we were expecting it from your side. Now he is. My turn will come soon. Don't worry, my friend. <laughs> uh, question. Mike Cho or Mike Cho, your ex Bulgari lounge manager and cigar sommelier. You know him. Yes, of course. Would it be unfair to state that Mike gave you and gave the lounge more than he got from you or he got from the lounge? I'm hinting um, why he left. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to take that question. I, uh, Mike, uh, you know, in 2012, when the Bulgari project was, uh, was uh, launching, we wanted to find someone who would look after our name, my father's name, and represent us as well, if not better, than we could without being there present. Because we couldn't conceivably have Davidov and run it the way we like to, and also be present in the Bulgari all the time. Uh, with Mike, we were hugely fortunate because he was, a, uh, he was back from Spain. He was a very experienced F and B operator. He knew how to look after customers beautifully, and he had. Excuse a, me, uh, gentlemen. Excuse <laughs> me. He had a fantastic interest in cigars. That was very important. And as soon as we discussed it with him, it was uh, it was magical. I've never seen someone take to a project and personalize it as much as he did. And really, the success we had in that lounge in the first few years was entirely down to Mike and, of course, Attila, who, who helped him very, very well as well. The original team, Mike and Attila, um, 
turned it into a true destination. People talked about it. We were honored by the Cigar Journal in 2015 as, as the best lounge. Uh, Mike ran it like it was his own business, which is all you could ever want from someone. The relationship ended not with us, but with the Bulgari, I would say. And it was because it was the right time for Mike to move on. He, his leg was hurting. He had a lot of other interests in the world of cigars that he wanted to pursue. He had worked in F&B for a very long time. And it's a very, very tiring, very physically demanding job. Seven days a week, on your feet all the time, late hours. So when he told me that he was approaching the time when he would want to leave, um, of course, it was with a very heavy heart for all of us. But it was also <coughs> knowing that he was not leaving our friendship. He was merely moving into the next chapter of his life. And to this day, he continues to very dear friend, someone we respect very much in the cigar world. Uh, the feeling is mutual, I know that. We see each other, if not every week, every other week. And if I ever had a project that involved a similar concept, a big lounge, and Mike wanted to do it, he would be the first person I would put there. Um, but of course, he's a successful businessman himself now. He's doing some wonderful importation of New World cigars. Uh, and his passion is unrivaled. He loves cigars. And he deserves all the success. He's a lovely, lovely boy. I mean, he lives, uh, uh, you wouldn't know uh, where I'm living, my house. He's literally stone throw away, about 55 meters away. So we see each other, especially on weekends when I'm washing my car, he would come around. We light up a cigar. Sometimes he gives me a hand <laughs> as well. So, you know, we're very dear friends. Good, good, good to hear that. Good to hear that. I was hoping to corner you guys, but you... you, you... <laughs> Not with Mike, no. You're perfect diplomats. <laughs> I, I, I will move to the questions of our audience. Uh, would you allow me the first question, Kasim? Yeah, sure. A dear Los Osos pillar from Dubai, Mr. Usama, is asking, are the Davidoff limited edition exclusive China? Year of the Rat. 2020 and year of the ox 2021 good cigars good enough to be tagged 100,000 uh, 1,000 USD per box or is it marketing gimmick he, he, uh, Osama is uh, obviously not happy with the with the releases nor the price as he stated he have tried them both with price, I would I would say if I was buying cigars today, I would probably ask a similar question. Um, it's different different for me on the on this side. I can smoke whatever I like, uh, and it doesn't cost me as much as as a true customer does. But if I address those two, the year of the rat and the year of the ox, Davidoff have produced beautiful cigars packaged beautifully. And the work that has gone into those cigars, I know very well the facilities they have and the quality control that goes behind it and the, and the effort that goes to, into the tobacco. So as a cigar lover, even if it, you don't enjoy the taste, is it worth a thousand dollars? No thousand dollars, a thousand dirhams or a thousand dollars? Well, in pounds, it's about 500 pounds. pounds so yeah. well, let's call it, uh, let's round it up to a thousand dollars. Uh, yes, it, it is worth that. And for a thousand dollars, you're lucky you'll get a good bottle of wine these days in a restaurant. Is that bottle of wine better than 10 extraordinary cigars? No. I will take the cigars any day and I will get many more hours of pleasure and hopefully nine friends of mine will also get many more or much more pleasure <laughs> than that one bottle of wine could ever provide. Good answer. Good answer. A question from a proud Lebanese Armenian aficionado and friend. His name is Harut Papazian. He's asking, in your opinion, was it a mistake that Zino Davidov exited Cuba? Which is contrary to my opinion. I personally say if Zino didn't exit Cuba and relaunch the brand in Dominican, there would have not been no Davidov cigar today. If it was me, I would rephrase the question as such. Was Zeno mistaken when he sold the business to Ettinger? 
Well, that is a question we should ask Zeno, and I'm sure if I put myself in his place, he had reached a stage in life where he wasn't going to work, or he couldn't perhaps work the way he used to. He had nobody to continue the business. He had only one daughter, Sonia, who was married to a, a lawyer, and... I'm sorry again, guys. My, I don't know what's happening with my phone. Please, don't, don't worry. worry. Don't worry. And uh, he had reached the end of the line in his life. And I think he was very fortunate that somebody like the Ottinger Group, Schneider, came uh, along and buy the cigar. Because Ottinger, you know, they were, the, they were and are still the largest... Uh, uh, not retail, wholesaler of tobacco, but they had all sort of agencies for all the cigarettes and other uh, small mini cigars, things like that. And, but also the magic of Dr. Schneider is Dr. Schneider took a small shop and turned it into a huge world business. He had that flair and uh, he could see the future by far better than anybody else could. When you know, the first time Dr. Schneider mentioned to me, he said, we are going to the uh, Dominican Republic. We're going to make cigars there. I said, Dr. Schneider, that will never happen. You know, it, it will be a total disaster. He says, no, I will make it happen. And it took a few years, a number of years, but he did it. Uh, would that have been the same if they had stayed in Cuba? No. Uh, in Cuba, as much as their cigars are delicious and lovely, uh, you cannot uh, be a private firm and uh, work there privately. You get what you are given. You cannot go there and tell them this tobacco is not good enough for my cigar. It doesn't work like that. Uh, where else in the Dominican Republic, it, the, Dr. Schneider's dream was that to have from A to Z uh, the production in his hands. He said, I, I want to see what, who plants the seed of the tobacco, and I want to see who buys the cigar and smokes it at the end. Uh, for that reason, for many years, they didn't even give uh, uh, any uh, uh, franchises to anybody else. Uh, when I opened the shop in 1980, I was the second franchisee, and even that was with a uh, bit hesitance because they only had one agent in, uh, uh, in Hong Kong, the Blue Bell Group, and the, uh, my shop was the second one. And uh, every other place, they would just open shops themselves because they were very much involved with the whole line from uh, seed to ash. Uh, would uh, he done it any differently? What would have been consequence? He would have been able to do that, you know. He knew that. That's why he sold the business. Uh, he was uh, fortunate that it went into the right hands. It could have been bought by a bank, it could have been bought by a group of investors, and eventually, with time, it would just disappear. You know, so many cigars came and went uh, in the last uh, 20, 25 years. Brands that came and went and disappeared. Uh, well, Stavidov just got better and better and better. Absolutely. If I can add a very good example, <laughs> is Dunhill. Yeah. Yes. You know, think about yeah. what happened to Dunhill, a parallel superlative cigar coming out of Cuba that went a very different direction. And today, does anyone talk about Dunhill cigars? Are there even Dunhill cigars you can buy? No. No longer. Yeah, true. Uh, Absolutely. Tassim, right. Or for you. Yes. Ali, Ali Khalil, a well-knowledgeable Lebanese aficionado, asking, what does a vintage or rare cigar has to offer that we don't, do not get from a top shelf premium cigar other than the bragging? Considering vintage cigar lose a lot of their characteristics. Uh, may, may I take that question? Yes, then? you're very qualified for that. I, I will, I, in, in my humble opinion, uh, a vintage cigar especially Cuban, which have the potential for more aging than the New World because of the way they're produced, um, they never lose or they never get worse. 
they become different. And uh, the best parallel I can draw is perhaps in the wine world, where certain wines will evolve with time. And there might be a strong opinion that their best moment to drink is 20 years, perhaps. Uh, you can drink them at five years, you can drink them at 50 years. And if your palate enjoys the taste of a very old uh, wine, you will drink it at 50 years and enjoy it. If you enjoy it very young and vivacious, you will drink it at five years. The same is true with cigars. And the reason you have to pay a lot more for a vintage cigar is not because the world has decided it's the best cigar and it's become even better with age. It's because there are much less around. It is purely scarcity that drives the price. Uh, your enjoyment is always your enjoyment. And my, my pleasure that I get from a 30, 35 year old Cuban cigar is not the same pleasure I get from a two year old Cuban cigar or any other cigar. It's a very different one, but it's one that my palate can also appreciate. And so I always put the question back to the customer or, or in your case, uh, one of your viewers to say, it's what you like. And if you like the old ones, un unfortunately, you will have to pay a little bit more for those old ones if you buy them later. Not more, <laughs> not little. <Yes. laughs> not more. <laughs> Thank you. Eli. The best is to buy it in good time, like wine. Uh, the year it comes, usually most of these cigars that come out, the first one or two years, you could spot a good cigar. And if you're going to buy a box, buy two boxes. That's what I tell my uh, customers when they come in. Uh, if you like this cigar, buy two, just two singles or two boxes, uh, whatever you can afford. Smoke one now, enjoy it, but put the other one aside and go back to it five years, maybe 10 years later, depending on the age of the customer. But the later you smoke it, the more you will enjoy it. And you still don't have to pay a premium then. Right. Uh, from all lounges etiquette, what is tolerable and shouldn't be broken and what is intolerable, too strict and is okay to break? Uh, in, in the etiquette of smoking cigars? In a lounge. Yeah, in a, in a lounge. Uh, I, 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 I can say as, as an operator, but also as a customer of, of many lounges, the first and most important thing is to respect the lounge to respect that they are a business. And if you visit a lounge, do not assume you can bring your own cigar and smoke it and have one cup of coffee and sit there for four hours, um, unless you're a very dear friend of the lounge. So establish the rules of the lounge before you enter. And if they require you to buy a cigar to enjoy, not to bring your own, respect that. Uh, if you're going to sit there for two, three hours and enjoy your cigar, make sure the waiter at least is well looked after. <laughs> Maybe order a few extra drinks. If not, give him a nice tip. Um, this will make your side of the relationship perfect. Uh, be respectful of your fellow guests. They all love cigars, but they may not all love your conversation on the telephone or uh, if you get very drunk and happy, keep that to yourself, perhaps. Don't impose it on your fellow uh, visitors in the lounge. Uh, but those are not difficult rules to follow. I think most of us, most cigar smokers I know, uh, naturally follow those rules. There are, there are very few arguments around that. Uh, and from the lounge's side, I think many lounges forget that uh, the person coming in is your guest. Again, it's a very simple uh, observation. You know, you do not have the right uh, to close your lounge and say, everyone out, I'm going to sit here on my own. When you open that door, the door is open for everyone and you make everyone feel like a million dollars. And if you can do that, the customer is happy, you are happy, and hopefully the, the bank manager is happy. <laughs> sure. Sure. Awesome. Uh, one more question. Having the opportunity to smoke one cigar with, with one of the following. Winston Churchill, Simon Chase, Zino Davidoff, 
Che Guevara and Jaime Partagas. Which one you choose? One. One. I would have to say Winston Churchill. <laughs> I was sure. Good answer. Hey, Churchill. <laughs> One Good day, answer. perhaps we will smoke a cigar together up there. <laughs> Good answer. Eddie? I, I, I think so. And I only say I think so because I've had the pleasure of smoking with Simon Chase many times. And oh, if okay. not, it would be Simon Chase because, uh, well, we all know he was a dear friend. Uh, and uh, I have never met someone who knows more and loves more a cigar. Um, Simon's passion for cigar was something else. Oh, yes. Yes. Exactly. Uh, I have a question from a client, uh, a, a, a viewer of us, not a client, uh, Remo Hanna. In August 2016, Urs Portman, you know him, when interviewed, stated the following. Uh, he was asked, did you like certain things better 45 years ago than you do today? And he said, yes, something bothering me today. When I think of the 1975, for example, of a Partagas, Partagas this, own Bolivar has its own character. A Hoyo has its own character. Today's cigars all have more or less a similar aroma. And he continues, I said this to the Cubans a few years ago, what a shame, why are you changing your products? The question is, would you agree with Urs? The character of cigar has changed. Uh, the appearance of the cigars have changed. <clears throat> I'm sure Urs will remember in the old days, you know, the, the wrappers were different to what we get now. And there's a whole new generation of rappers being used but also uh, i'm sure you will remember uh, it was in the late 70s when there was something called the blue mold uh, which is uh, some sort of a fungus that sort of suddenly attacks the field and destroys the whole field and the cubans they had to destroy so many fields to overcome that and uh, because of that they managed to regenerate a new generation of tobacco leaves which were very resistant towards that uh, on the other hand they're much more tougher uh, wrappers if you see the majority of the limited edition cigars that come out nowadays uh, they're dark and oily and slightly rough uh, finishes uh, personally i love the old ones the very delicate smooth silky wrappers of the old days there were something else uh, is it a bad thing? Is it a good thing? Well, I, I think it's it, it's a matter of give and take. Uh, uh, yes, in the old days they were different, uh, but so so many other things were different as well. Uh, the fruit and vegetables that we used to taste in those days to now, it's much more different. Uh, uh, and perhaps that explains why some of the older cigars are fetching so, so much more uh, value for them uh, in the auctions because many people still remember and enjoy the, those old flavors. I, 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 the, the question was an excellent question. I, 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 I do, I have some serious sympathy for Mr. Portman's uh, point of view because um, even I remember smoking a Partagas in late 80s, early 90s, a Partagas D4. And it was profoundly peppery, extraordinarily strong. It was, you know, practically should have come with a health warning that, you know, don't touch this unless you're 40 years old. Uh, <laughs> and had a good lunch. <laughs> uh, today you pick up a Partagas D4 off the shelf and you can smoke it almost as comfortably as, a, as an Epicure number no. two. Uh, it, it will certainly not have those characteristics. Is that better or worse? Um, that's the million dollar question. I mean, we have to trust the market to some degree. Um, would I like them all to have very distinct personalities? Yes, but at what cost? Because then you will find one brand dominates the market entirely. Um, the one brand that everyone agrees is the best flavor. Good Today, Good many brands are smoked by many people. Good answer. 
Yeah. Awesome. We all know we we all know the official story that only surfaced in 1994 in Cigar Aficionado. We all know know this uh, interview. Put this put this aside. Which cigar came first? The Davidoff number one, number two, and the Ambassadrice, or the Cohiba Lancero, the Corona Especial, and the Banatella. Feel free uh, to, to answer. As far as my memory and knowledge goes back to, it was the Davidoff number one, number two, and the Ambassadrice. <laughs> uh, the dates have changed, and when I opened the shop, the I, I did not have a Cohiba. I didn't even know there was a cigar called Cohiba, nor we were offered a cigar called Cohiba. It was Davidoff. Uh, and then slowly, gradually, we got the Lancero and the Corona Special and uh, the Panatella. After. The Panatella. Uh, so as far as I know, it was definitely Davidoff who came first. But my knowledge is not 100% complete, so I don't know. We don't know. We only raise a question. <laughs> uh, I would like to find out the real answer one day. We only have from the audience. Do you still have time? Or, uh, of course, we have as much time as you need. Please. Let we me... open the job at 9.30 tomorrow morning, so we have plenty of time. <laughs> uh, Hamu asked, can we say that the Davidoff short perfecto is like the forgotten Davidoff that no one talks about? We, 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 may, do, do we know which one he is referring to? Which the Davidoff short perfecto. But which which forgotten Davidoff? Pro, uh, I mean, uh, he's re, uh, probably he's referring to the Cubans ones. The Cuban. Uh, it's it's certainly it's certainly on strength and development, much closer to the Cubans. Um, it, it, the Short Perfecto is another fantastic cigar to offer a Cuban, uh, only Cuban smoker, because it will surprise them how much personality and how many uh, uh, similarities they can find in what they enjoy from a cigar. Uh, so that's a great cigar to, to, to experiment with. Um, and if, if ever the 702 Short Perfecto is available uh, for 7 Amu, um, please try the 702 version as well. For me, that's even closer to, to, to the fabled Cuban profile. Mr. Frankenstein asking a question to Edward, please. Is it easier or more challenging to open a cigar shop today than back in 1980? I think that even today it would be as difficult as it was then or as easy. Uh, it depends where you're opening and what you're intending to do. Uh, the, the only difficulties that are more now than it was then is all the red tape involved in it. Uh, if you're opening a shop, there's so many uh, minor, well, not minor, ma major details. You have to go into air purifying ventilations and regulations and the fire regulations and the health and safety and all these things. In those days, none of that really existed, you know. The shop was just a shop and very easy to do. The people were happy to see you opening a shop and employing people. Nowadays, uh, so many different things get involved in it. We still get visits from the council. We get visits from people. And uh, if somebody's walking into the street and smells a cigar, and if he complains, oh, God, you know, why does he complain or things like that? Uh, but no, it, it's as easy or as difficult as opening any shop these days. The same uh, concept depends on which country you're doing that. Of course, from country to country is different. Some countries, I know, for instance, in France, you cannot just go and open a tobacco shop. You would need a license, and the license you can only get if your father was killed in the war, or if you were in, or your grandfather was injured in a war, or things like that. Whereas in the UK, there is no such uh, problem. You just apply and uh, you do the necessary work. Uh, it shouldn't be a problem at all. Uh, a question from Dr. Az. In general and on average, what minimum aging do you recommend for a Davidoff cigar 
knowing it's an estimate and the first blend to blend. Go on, Andy. Yeah. Uh, in, 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 in my opinion, the, the, the Davidoffs, as with most New World cigars, they arrive always very ready to enjoy, but I like to keep them for about two years. Um, I find they settle. There's, there's not a profound change in the, in the flavor profile, but there's an imperceptible harmonizing of the, of the aroma. And it's much less than you find in Cubans. Cubans change more dramatically, but uh, Davidoff, I would estimate two years is a good, is a good time. When a cigar is produced, they need time to rest. They need time to uh, have a resting period. In the old days, and it goes back only when it was being shipped from Cuba, and if you uh, come across the word shipped or shipping, they always say they shipped the cigars, which was uh, exactly what they did. They used to produce the cigars put them on these ships, and then the ship would make its way from Cuba, go up North America, and then from there, cross the Atlantic, if they were lucky, crossing it. And then they would go into Amsterdam, and from there they would go to Germany, and then eventually you know, make their way down to the Docklands in England. So this took a voyage of around six months. Whilst these cigars were on a ship in a humid condition and going through a resting period, and then when it came to the docks, it would sit in the warehouses uh, until it was taken out of the warehouses and the duties was paid. But the whole process took a year, maybe two years sometimes. Nowadays, uh, you order your cigars or a cigar is ready. Uh, if it's ready and packed today, tomorrow morning it's on the plane from Havana, flies into any of the countries where it's going, and three, four, five days, maybe at the most, a week later, it's in the shop of a retailer. Uh, so it falls on the shoulders of a retailer to give that period of rest. Some cigars need more time to rest. Some cigars need less time to rest. And that's where the involvement of the retailer comes. Because every time we get a shipment, uh, now it's more on Eddie's uh, shoulders than mine. But we always, uh, the first box that arrives, we open it. It's, first thing we do is smell it, look at it, and then take one out and smoke it. So, oh, oh, this is lovely. This is ready to be sold. Or I think we need to put this aside, give it some time. And the customer will say, oh, do you have this cigar? I say, yes, we have it, but you know, we're not selling it yet. Why aren't you selling it? Well, you could buy it, but please don't smoke it. Take it home, keep it for a while, and then smoke it. It, it does make a difference. I think that would answer Ali Qatari. Uh... The question, can we age all kinds of cigar? Let's move to another one. From our friend, a smoky cigar inside. He's a dear friend. How did the taste of people evolve during the years? Is it influenced by trends or newly production? The taste of people, the taste of people changes with time and with age. I mean, what I used to find delicious when I was much younger is different to what I find delicious now. Uh, do I drink the same wine I used to drink 25, 30 years ago? No. Uh, do I eat the same food I used to eat 25, 30 years ago? The answer is no. Uh, well, you'd still like to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would still like to, but uh, you know, there, there was a time that uh, a meal did not finish until I had the proper dessert. And I mean a proper dessert. Nowadays, that's all gone, either for a reason or just because my palate has changed. Uh, I think everybody has to take that on their own. You know, cigar, when you're smoking a cigar, there isn't really any particular rule or description for it. A cigar is there to give you, the cigar smoker, pleasure. And you enjoy it anyway it gives you that pleasure. If it gives you the pleasure of smoking it whilst you're eating, so be it. I don't do that. I don't like eating and smoking. I like to enjoy my food and I like to enjoy my cigar, but away from each other, not at the same time. Uh, everybody's got a, a different uh, palate and a matter of time. I mean, do people have the same amount of time now as they did before? No, we don't have the time. Uh, there was a time where we used to 
you would be invited by your bank manager to go to the bank and have a spot of lunch, which was three hours that spot. Now, you're lucky to get a cup of coffee meeting your bank manager, if you meet him at all. <laughs> uh, you book a restaurant in, in London in particular, you book a restaurant and uh, they say, what time do you want to come? Well, we want to come 8 o'clock. No, no, you can't come 8 o'clock. You have to come 8.30. Okay, 8.30. And you have to leave by 10 o'clock. And they tell you when you have to come. They tell you when you have to leave. They tell you how much time you have. And within that two hours time, you have to have your starter, you have to have your wine, you have to have your main course, you have to have your dessert if you're having any, you have to have your coffee and 10 o'clock. And before 10 o'clock, you see already there's another uh, queue waiting to take your table and they stare so much at you that your coffee doesn't even go down your throat because people are <laughs> waiting for you to get up. So here you are. <laughs> I'm sure you don't have that problem in Beirut, but over here it's happening a lot, my friend. <laughs> no. uh, HK Jafar is asking, he never tried the pipe yet. He is very tempted to. Will smoking pipe give you the same pleasure as smoking a cigar? I think you answered that. I... Yeah, yes. I would say no, it won't. Uh, and to be honest, if you've never smoked a pipe, uh, and you want to smoke a pipe, the only advice I could give to Mr. Jaffer is buy a very cheap pipe. Buy any tobacco you would like, but make sure it's mild tobacco, nothing too strong, slightly aromatic, and uh, try it. Because most probably eight out of ten times, that pipe that you buy after a while will be redundant and you'll just put it somewhere and forget about it. But if you do want to try it, don't spend a lot of money buying an expensive pipe. It's not going to last. Usually it doesn't. I think we, uh, we, we are done with the question. Any last word, Edward? I know we tired you. Not at all. Listen, uh, my dear friend, to talk to a cigar smoker and a cigar lover, there is nothing tiring about it. That's the beauty of our... Uh, industry, you know, you could sit and talk about cigars until tomorrow morning and still you will not feel tired. I wanted to thank you. Thank you both so much. Uh, it's so lovely to see you. I, I do have one question. Please. We've been following the news uh, and sometimes the news media is not very kind. Is it as bad as it they show on television in Beirut, the streets and everything or uh, are we worried too much? I, I, have, I still have many dear friends uh, in Beirut, either living there or who are there at the moment, and sometimes I do worry about them. Is my worry justified or unjust? Let, let, let me take this. Uh, I, and you could answer first, anything you want, so I understand. <laughs> it is worse than you uh, would have anticipated yet. Lebanon is a country where people love to live. We are bon vivers. We are yeah, born yeah. as bon yeah. vivers. And uh, we all have the faith that we will overcome this few years from now. And we are uh, ought to rebound and go back to be the Switzerland of the East. Uh, yes, it is bad, but we are hopeful and we remain hopeful and we are a people that love to live well. God willing that everything will turn out well because I remember when we used to live in Iran, uh, Lebanon or Beirut was uh, for us, it was the Switzerland of the Middle East. It, it was a dream to go to Beirut. A matter of fact, it was, uh, I'll tell you this little story, it was 19... It was March 1972, and my wife was pregnant with young Eddie. So Eddie, his birthday is in July. It's actually tomorrow his birthday. Happy birthday. Uh, happy, happy birthday. So I think, uh, she was about seven Old months uh, pregnant with Eddie, and uh, it was no ruse, which is the new year for Iran. I said, let's go to Beirut. And we went there for... Three days, four days, it, it coincided with Easter as well. So Eddie has been to Beirut, but uh, <laughs> under different circumstances. <laughs> an inside, an inside I, I, view. I had some 
fond memories from there, you know, the, the shops, the food, the Casino de la Bain, everything, you know, the, the Phoenicia Hotel, I remember sitting there yeah. in the bar, watching people swim from the bar, it had that glass wall there. Uh, but I hope everything will turn out to be well, and we will be able to finally uh, together come and visit you, you all. You will, tr you will be to most welcome. airport, back to airport, by me and Kasim. You will thank be you so well. Eddie, any final word? Uh, just to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Uh, the pleasure to, to, to meet with you, albeit uh, on digital forum. Uh, let's say this is the entree and the main, the main course we will meet in person and enjoy cigars together. Inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you for your hospitality. Thank you for bringing us. Uh, thank you for hosting us so beautifully. Your questions are amongst the best I have ever been asked and have really made me think. So thank you for preparing <laughs> the interview so well. It's uh, been a sheer delight and I could think of no better way to spend my birthday eve. I will be 49 tomorrow, but I'm still young, 48 today, than with yourselves. <laughs> so, so today is the 48 years old Eddie talking. Tomorrow you will mature. <laughs> Tomorrow we'll be a year older. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We wish you all We'd the like best. Thank you so much. And thank you to your lovely audience, the viewers. I hope they enjoyed listening to us. We uh, did sometimes enjoy. I talk a bit too much, but also. wherever you are, all of you, all over the world, I hope you we enjoyed it. And yeah, inshallah, God willing, we will meet again. Sure, inshallah. We will thank you also inshallah. again from the bottom of our heart to be to be our our guest tonight thank you thank you very much thank, thank you, you very much gentlemen thank you thank you so much love you Gen thank good you. night gentlemen bye-bye bye-bye